It's Halloween night. A man collapses, bleeding from the mouth. He's alone in his apartment, watching a horror movie marathon, and now he thinks he might be dead by dawn. But how? All he'd done was eat a microwaved mini pizza and drink a soda he picked up from a nearby candy store. Was it poison? Why do his guts feel like they're twisting themselves into knots? As he falls to his knees, spluttering and retching, clutching his agonized stomach, his organs lurch, and he vomits a red-tinged mess onto the floor. He can't believe what he's seeing. Is his puke full of broken glass? Across town, some trauma surgeons at the local hospital are having an extremely unpleasant evening. As a few patients with severe gastric distress are rolled into the ER in need of urgent medical attention, of course, adding a layer of surreality to the whole event, the patients in question are in costume, as Beetlejuice and Elsa from Frozen, respectively. Only on Halloween, the team thinks, somehow in unison. They start taking emergency x-rays and are astonished at what they see. Worms. But not standard intestinal worms, the kind of nightmarish worms that would seem far more at home at the bottom of the deep ocean the kind with big, sharp pincers full of painful venom, the kind of worms you definitely wouldn't want to be on the business side of, let alone having swimming around in your guts. One of the doctors in attendance exhaustedly remarks that this is even worse than the person they had in earlier that night, whose intestines were inexplicably full of disgusting rotten berries. People seem to do bizarre and crazy things on Halloween, he thinks to himself, as the nurses draw the cut here lines on the stomach of the screaming patients and the doctor readies his scalpel. But our story isn't about any of these people on Halloween night. It's about a humble little ghost. Happy Halloween, please take one. The neighbor's sign had been pretty explicit about that. Hearing the blood-curdling screams filling the room, frozen to the spot in terror, and watching wide-eyed as a person convulses on the ground, the ghost wishes he'd heeded the warning. He's too old for trick-or-treating, but his parents insist he has to. After all, he can't leave his little brother to walk around the neighborhood on his own, even if it'll still be light out. So he begrudgingly throws an old bedsheet over his head, cuts two holes in it, and voila, he's a ghost. And none of his friends have to see him out trick-or-treating like a little kid. Every time they knock at one of the houses on the street, he wishes this would just be over. Texts are flooding in from his friends, telling him to hurry up and meet them so they can head over to the house party like they planned to. The ghost rolls his eyes every time his little brother races off to another house with a jack-o'-lantern out front, eager to fill his bag with more and more candy. After each door closes, he tells his younger sibling this is it, that they won't be visiting any more houses after this. But before he can herd him back towards their parents' place, his brother is already speeding off in the other direction. They arrive at one of the quieter houses on the block. There are hardly any other trick-or-treaters around, barely anyone else in costume. The ghost urges his little brother to come back home, insisting it doesn't look like anyone's here. The house isn't even decorated. All the lights are out, save for a candle flickering inside a carved pumpkin. Immediately, the brother rushes over to knock on the door. There's no answer, just a silence that hangs in the air and stretches out every second. He knocks again, but still nobody answers. No one to answer the door for the boy to ask, trick or treat to. The ghost tries to urge his sibling to leave. The owners, whoever they are, seem to have left a bucket of candy in front of their door, with a sign encouraging people to help themselves. Another text from his friends makes the ghost all the more eager to go. By now, he's missing the party. His brother insists that he can't take the candy unless he gets to ask the owners trick or treat. Eventually, growing frustrated, the ghost has to drag his little brother away. Before he leaves, he looks over his shoulder to see if anyone else is watching, before swiping the full, unattended candy bucket and tipping its contents into the sheet of his ghost costume, deciding he might as well take them as party favors. But before we go on, I want to thank the sponsor of this video, War Thunder. Imagine commanding a vast arsenal of over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships, ranging from the raw power of the 1920s to the cutting-edge technology of modern fighter jets and main battle tanks representing 10 major nations. And forget about something as simple as hit points. In War Thunder, each vehicle component, from engines to ammo racks, can be individually damaged or destroyed by enemy fire for an unmatched level of detail in combat. And the damage doesn't just happen unseen. The game's X-ray view allows you to witness the precise impact of your strategies, showing exactly where and how your actions affect the enemy. 
bringing a new level of depth to your combat tactics. But War Thunder isn't just for the hardcore simulator fan. Whether you're looking for quick, action-packed encounters or the ultimate realism challenge, there's a game mode for you. From the fast-paced arcade mode, the balanced realistic mode, to the fully immersive simulator mode, each offers a unique way to experience the game's breathtaking battles. And the best part? You don't need any fancy hardware to jump into the action. Whether you're piloting a plane or driving a tank, a simple mouse and keyboard or controller is all you need, even in the most realistic simulator mode. Join the ranks of a global community of over 70 million players by clicking on my link in the description to grab your massive bonus pack. This exclusive offer for new and returning players who haven't played for at least six months includes multiple premium vehicles, an exclusive vehicle decorator Eagle of Valor, 100,000 Silver Lions, and seven days of premium account. But remember, it's only available for a limited time. Now back to our trick or treater. Returning his brother home, the ghost races back out just as the evening turns into night. Crossing town as quickly as he can, he arrives at the house party, greeted by his friends dressed as werewolves and vampires. He hadn't realized everyone would still be doing costumes, breathing a sigh of relief under his ghost sheet, only to wish he'd put more effort into the costume. He dumps the stolen candy into a big communal bowl, overflowing with sugary snacks, before heading into the party. It doesn't take the ghost long to realize that the event isn't all it's cracked up to be. Feeling too awkward to go up and talk to anyone, he floats around, boredly sipping a drink from a plastic cup like a literal ghost at the feast. He started feeling guilty about being a jerk to his brother, making him rush trick-or-treating so the ghost could come to a lame party. But just as he's about to leave, somebody screams. One of the party guests is holding a packet of gummy bears in one hand, the same ones that the ghost swiped earlier. The other hand is clutching his stomach in pain as something seems to be moving. The ghost blinks, certain it's a trick of the strobing lights at the party. He moves to get a better look, just in time to see the guest collapse. People nearby start panicking, telling each other to call an ambulance, worried that someone's having a severe allergic reaction. Then something moves again. The limp body of the party guest starts thrashing around, convulsing on the floor. It's like there's something inhuman, some creature inside his stomach, moving around and trying to claw its way out. And then it does, and it roars. The ghost stares in horror as what looks like a small bear tears itself free, flecks of blood staining its bright green fur and dripping from its paws. The screams erupting around it startle the creature, and it lunges for the nearest person, baring its sharp teeth and clamping them down in a vicious bite. The ones who are far away enough start running. The ghost isn't so lucky. The mint green bear leaps off of its latest victim and fixes its confused, murderous eyes onto the ghost. He's frozen in place by pure terror as the little bear lunges for him, flecking the blood of its previous victim onto his formerly white sheet. As the bear's jaws close around his face, his closing thoughts are of his younger sibling. He should have just stayed trick-or-treating tonight. Out on the ocean, the blades of a matte black stealth chopper slice through the air. The crew working aboard a freighter, hauling goods across the water, only notice the helicopter as it swoops in low, descending from overhead. Before the captain even has a chance to hail the aircraft and request that those aboard identify themselves, it's already coming in for a landing. Figures in tactical gear, all brandishing automatic weapons, spill out of the chopper as the captain sounds the alarm. Crew members scatter, running for their lives but with no way to escape the cargo vessel, surrounded by the roaring waves of the supply route they're sailing along. Everyone panics. They've been boarded. But these armed figures aren't pirates. They're far too well equipped. They look almost military. In fact, they're outfitted in gear that seems closer to special forces. SCP Foundation Mobile Task Force operatives storm the ship, splitting into smaller teams. One rushes after the boat's crew, rounding them up and herding them toward the bridge. The other squad sweeps the deck, weaving in between the rows of towering shipping containers, searching the cargo for… something. Within minutes, the freighter's crew are helplessly kneeling on the floor of the bridge, hands placed on the backs of their heads in compliance with the orders of these soldiers bearing a strange, unfamiliar insignia on their uniforms. The group's commander instructs two of his men to search for a cargo manifest, and in moments, they've found the relevant document relaying the serial number of one of the containers to the squad on the ship's deck. The commander begins questioning the captain of the vessel and his crew, 
seemingly interested in the contents of this one container. Not one of them knows what's inside. All they know is it's bound for the port they were heading to. What nobody notices, though, is the accidental adjustment to the ship's course caused by a turn of the main wheel during the commotion. The freighter is passing down a narrow waterway that is part of the trade route, only now, instead of sailing straight, it's traveling at an angle. On the ship's deck, the MTF operators locate the shipping container they've been directed to. It's locked, naturally, but the team has come prepared. As the rest of the squad form up and cover the crate, one of them rushes to the front, buzzsaw in hand. Sparks fly as a spinning blade slices through the various locks, keeping the long metal container shut tight. In seconds, the saw severs each one, and two of the MTF soldiers stow their weapons, wrenching the container's doors open while the others keep their guns trained on what might be inside. The MTF quickly examines the contents of the shipping container, noting the various cardboard boxes inside. One hears a command squawked through their radio from the commander, stating he needs visual confirmation that what they're looking for is, in fact, inside those boxes. The operator unsheathes their combat knife and effortlessly slices through the tape holding the box shut. And sure enough, inside is… The arrival of the SCP Foundation on a cargo freighter might to some indicate that some kind of anomalous creature is being transported across the ocean, or that the ship's crew are perhaps smugglers, stashing anomalies aboard their vessel's cargo hold on behalf of a shady group of interest like the Chaos Insurgency. The only thing that nobody would expect would be for the Foundation to send its operatives to intercept a shipment of… candy. Packets upon packets of gelatin gummies and prepackaged berries are inside most of the boxes, with others full to the brim of cans of soda and cellophane wrapping to keep them secure. The packaging has been purposely designed to mimic popular brands. The operator almost had to squint to notice the logos for a company named Pure Foods. They held the items close to their body cam, highlighting that these weren't products from the likes of Haribo or Coca-Cola, no matter how much they looked to be. Confirming they'd found what they'd been sent for, the commander radios back to the Foundation, telling them to dispatch an extraction unit to retrieve the intercepted shipment. Within minutes, the huge twin rotors of an enormous VTOL craft are whipping the air around the freighter. Down on the ship's deck, MTF operators attach cables and chains to the shipping container, signaling the pilots above once it's secure. The long metal crate is hauled up into the air beneath the tilt rotor, met with words of protest from the captive crew members, which are soon silenced as the Foundation operatives administer each of them with amnestics. The manifest is replaced with a falsified one, with the relevant container's number missing, its existence completely covered up. Suddenly, the ship lurches beneath their feet, the rumble of impact causing a deafening creak as hundreds of tons of metal collide with something. The MTF troops scramble back to their feet, weapons at the ready, expecting to see an anomalous threat has attacked the boat. Instead, from the ship's bridge, the commander sees clearly what has happened. The freighter has been traveling at an angle and is now wedged against the narrow banks of the canal. Barking a panicked order at his troops, the commander and the rest of the MTF make a hasty retreat, the chopper departing just as the crew of the Ever Given awaken, finding themselves very confused and very stuck. The bafflement felt by the ship's crew, now trapped in the Suez Canal, would soon be shared by people across the world, as this single vessel blocks a waterway crucial to the global supply chain. But luckily, despite the disruptions their actions had caused, the Foundation had at least succeeded in securing a shipment of SCP-5110 before it could reach the port. Sure, the raid by their mobile task force might have led to a ship becoming accidentally stuck in the Suez but it was deemed an acceptable outcome by the O5 Council. If those Pure Foods products had been distributed to retailers, they would have become even harder to track down. SCP-5110 is the designation given to a collection of packaged food products made under the branding of Pure Foods. So far, the Foundation's efforts to track down the owners of Pure Foods or any potential parent company that owns the brand have all been dead leads. Cargo manifests for the various shipments of their products never contain any actionable intelligence about the origin of Pure Foods items, with seemingly great lengths taken to remove any information about where the products are even manufactured or sent from. The items themselves are hardly up to FDA standards for safe human consumption, let alone the SCP Foundations. Upon being ingested, the various forms of SCP-5110 are known to trigger adverse anomalous side effects on any person who happens to ingest them. 
Insidiously, the SCP-5110 products seem to have been intentionally designed to resemble familiar products sold by popular confectionery brands, possibly in a malicious attempt by Pure Foods to trick unwitting consumers into buying their anomalous products. However, while they are similar to existing widely sold candies and soft drinks, SCP-5110 rarely reaches the shelves of larger supermarket chains, instead often shipped to and sold at smaller convenience stores. This, at least, limits the number of civilians that can accidentally consume them, although it does not prevent that possibility entirely. The four SCP-5110 products currently known to the Foundation each cause a different anomalous effect on the consumer. The severity of the side effects of each Pure Foods item can vary, with some being considerably less harmful and others even being fatal. An anomalous effect is guaranteed, though, to afflict someone consuming one of the products. The first of these is designated as SCP-5110-A, a container of assorted berries with Pure Foods branding and the name Pure Berries on the packaging. Once a person eats these, they will experience the rapid manifestation of rotting berries growing within their digestive system. This might be highly unpleasant to experience, but can be treated, and is considered preferable to the effects of other Pure Foods products. Case in point, SCP-5110-B is the designation given to an item called Pure Soda, a seemingly innocuous can containing carbonated mineral water. The Pure Foods branding is once again present, but closely resembles the packaging used by established soft drink companies such as Pepsi and Coca-Cola. However, far from being a refreshing sugar and corn syrup rich drink, SCP-5110-B has the unfortunate side effect of causing multiple glass bottles to form within the digestive system of a person who has drunk pure soda. These glass bottles are each 237 milliliters in capacity, less than the typical 250 milliliters of a glass Coca-Cola bottle. However, the volume of these bottles is usually not a concern of anyone who finds them in their digestive system, especially as the glass often shatters thanks to internal pressure, causing severe injury and the need for emergency surgery in order to remove any fragments. Pure Worms, or SCP-5110-C, are one of the varieties of Haribo-like candies created by Pure Foods. Contained within the packaging are colorful gummy worms containing various different flavorings and sweeteners. Should a person ingest any of these candies, then they will experience arguably the worst side effect of all Pure Foods products. Entering a person's digestive system, SCP-5110-C will trigger the manifestation of entities that resemble Eunice Aphroditus, more commonly known as Bobbit worms. Commonly found in coral reefs and in warmer waters like the Atlantic Ocean, Bobbit worms are a form of bristle worm that burrow their bodies under soft sand on the seabed, waiting to detect prey with their antenna. When they do, these aquatic ambush predators will grab at passing fish with sharp bristles. While bobbit worms rarely, if ever, attack humans, their mandibles are not only sharp enough to cut a fish in half, but are also venomous and could cause a person permanent nerve damage on contact. Having numerous entities similar to bobbit worms within a person's digestive system is, understandably, a cause for panic. The potential risk of internal bleeding and nerve damage from the sharp mouth parts aside, the burrowing nature of these worms can lead to significant and potentially fatal bodily trauma. When extracted surgically from a person or recovered posthumously, these bobbit worm-like creatures appear to be dyed in bright colors, resembling the SCP-5110-C Pure Worms candies. The fourth of the currently known Pure Foods products resembles other familiar and popular gummy candies. SCP-5110-D, or Pure Bears, appear to be multi-flavored gummy bears. Upon initial ingestion of one of these, the anomalous effects typically won't be felt immediately and can normally take anywhere between a full day or several to manifest. Once this occurs, however, whoever consumed the Pure Bears will have a juvenile Ursus arctos forming within their digestive system, the species more commonly known as the brown bear. To reiterate, this isn't a baby brown bear or an embryo of one, but instead a fully formed juvenile bear. Upon removal from the subject, or should the confined animal claw its way out, the bear's fur will appear to be dyed with bright colors that resemble the color of the gummy bear the person had consumed. Naturally, in accordance with their standard experimentation procedure, the Foundation has been able to document the effects of the various SCP-5110 products through extensive tests that utilize Class D personnel as test subjects. 
no other members of Foundation personnel are permitted to consume anything made by Pure Foods. Any of their anomalous products, including those recovered from retail outlets and intercepted shipments, are to be stored in a secure containment locker at a Foundation facility. Present on the back of all SCP-5110 products are a series of statements from their manufacturer, Pure Foods. Besides their own branding, this is the only consistent inclusion on their packaging. According to the company's own messaging, its mission statement is to deliver consumers with products that do not include additional unhealthy ingredients such as excess sugars, corn syrup, and other additives that are typically added to either artificially alter a product's taste or to make them more addictive for consumers. Pure Foods claims not to include fats or sugars that can lead to potential health complications when eaten in excess. Instead, they claim to take the essence of foods and encase them in gelatin. The nutritional information for a packet of Pure Bears, or SCP-5110-D, is listed as follows. 58,000 calories, 40,000 grams of total fat, 16 grams of sodium, with zero carbohydrates, zero sugars, and 260,000 grams of protein. The only ingredient listed is simply bear. Thank you again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video, which is available for free on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox. Make sure to sign up using my link in the description to grab your massive bonus pack. This exclusive offer for new and returning players who haven't played for at least six months includes multiple premium vehicles, an exclusive vehicle decorator Eagle of Valor, 100,000 Silver Lions, and seven days of premium account. But remember, it's only available for a limited time. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1048, Builder Bear.